This introductory chapter is on uh, defining what biology is. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at the first section. And the first section is uh, going to define biology for us. It is the science of life. And uh, the learning outcomes for this are to compare biology to other natural sciences and then to describe the characteristics of a living systems. What is it that makes something living? as opposed to non-living, and then characterize the hierarchy of organization or levels of organization in living systems, something you've seen before. Now, this right here is not a definition for biology, but it is true of biology in that it, uh, it's the foundation for all of the, or, or helps to unify a lot of the natural sciences. Now, natural sciences do include um, uh, biology, of course, Earth science, chemistry, physics. Uh, so, uh, if we were to define what natural science is, but within uh, the life science, uh, the uh, the foundation for all of that is the the physics and the chemistry. Uh, overall, uh, anything in biology cannot violate the laws of chemistry and physics. But uh, what is biology itself uh, is a very broad field. And within this field, things uh, are um, are interconnected, and biology is finding its way into other fields too that traditionally were kept separate, like say psychology and so on, which are in the behavioral sciences. Uh, as it turns out, we are living systems. So, what is biology itself? Uh, definition is the study of living things, or. Yeah, living things would be good, or organisms, which are living things, that would be a redundant. So um, the living systems themselves are going to be quite complex uh, bodies of, uh, of chemical reactions that occur uh, within the bodies of living things. This includes cells and then multicellular organisms like trees or humans. Uh, and like I said before, uh, the properties of life cannot violate uh, chemistry or physics uh, laws that we have described. Uh, the science itself is becoming very interdisciplinary, and that means many fields are uh, becoming more and more integrated. So uh, you'll see uh, many sciences now that uh, will talk about principles in other areas because the connections are being made there. Uh, and so when it comes to defining life, it's not easy. How do you know when you see something that's living? So these are some um, of the characteristics. They are organized. All living things are organized into the simplest units called cells. Uh, anything less than a cell is not considered alive. For example, the viruses. Viruses are not living, but they interact very closely uh, with complex living systems. They hijack cells and, and uh, get cells to make copies of them. They're very complex, but so are non-living things. Non-living structure or non-living systems can be very complex. So defining life itself is not very simple. It requires many uh, to consider many factors in order to define it. Living things respond to stimuli. That means they're sensitive to the environment. So another way to say this is to respond uh, to environment. Uh, so, for example, uh, trees, roots grow down towards gravity and the shoots grow towards uh, upward, uh, towards light. Uh, living things grow, develop, and reproduce. So, uh, even a simple cell, um, a new cell that is uh, made from a prior living cell and the cell divides, the cells are smaller, they're going to grow, and they go, they'll go through developmental, uh, a bit of development as they mature and function, and living things must be able to reproduce. Now, again, these things are not uh, always necessarily uh, unique to living things. Uh, for example, uh, uh, crystal minerals uh, minerals can crystallize and grow. Those crystals can grow, uh, but that doesn't mean they're living. Living things also utilize energy, so energy is used by living things to maintain order. Otherwise, you get disorder. Molecules will want to tend to break apart. And then living things need to maintain a stable internal environment. That's the definition of homeostasis. So homeostasis is to maintain. Maintain an internal st uh, stable environment. Uh, living things also evolve. Uh, the individual itself uh, 
organism does not evolve, but within the population of the same species, uh, there's variation in there and generate as the generations uh, are produced over long periods of time, changes do occur based on um, that genetic variation that's there. So living things evolve and they adapt to their environment as the environment changes. Uh, those populations go through changes and adapt. Um, there is a hierarchy of organization, uh, and there's a nice diagram that goes through the different levels. The lowest level of organization that's most relevant to biology would be at the atomic level, the atoms, which are the smallest units of elements that you learn in chemistry. Physicists will go below that, so uh, you would uh, go into uh, the subatomic particles like protons, electrons, neutrons, and then even smaller, these quarks or smaller parts of these structures. But when it comes to living things, we have uh, different levels of organization. You start with atoms, and then on this diagram it does it nicely. Atoms can bond to each other to form molecules, and then you get macromolecules. You probably recognize this double helix here from a uh, science class you might have had even in middle school. It's a DNA double helix. And then you have organelles. This is a mitochondrion, which is singular for mitochondria. Uh, it's magnified many, many times. And this is a small little part that helps... Uh, break down food to produce energy in the form of ATP. It's just one of many organelles found in the cell. And then here's an example of a cell. This is a neuron. That's the next higher level of organization. This is a neuron and it, um, we're looking at it from the surface. This is a special technique of imaging one. Uh, and then if we take that neuron and many neurons and with the supporting cells, you'll have nervous tissue. So tissue is the next level of organization. Then this tissue can form uh, two or more tissues come together to form a, an organ, like the brain there. It's not just nervous tissue, you can have connective tissue um, and other of the major animal tissues that produce it. And then you can have an organ system, in this case the nervous system, which includes the brain, spinal cord, nerves, and receptors. And then you have the entire organism, in this case uh, looks like a Canada goose there. Uh, so these levels here, make sure you know them. Uh, and in biology, we can go greater than the individual multicellular organism, and here you can go into a population. So a population would be many individuals living in an area of geese, a species of goose, right? So ignore the ducks there. Now, if you look at all the waterfowl in there, there's a community of water birds there. Uh, and so the water birds would be at the community level of organization. And then we have the non-living aspects uh, where that community exists, which includes sunlight, water availability, and so on. Uh, and this would be an ecosystem. And the major ecosystems are called biomes, uh, like desert, rainforest, all of those combine to make one large system called the biosphere. And at any one level of organization, when you start from the lowest, you go to the highest. At any one level of organization, you're going to see properties at a higher level of organization that you could not predict from a lower level. So let's take atoms here. We'll start at the lowest level uh, that's relevant to biology. So if we took atoms, uh, to make my example, if we took atoms of sodium, and I gave you a sample of sodium atoms, here's a, here's a chunk of sodium, it's a metal. And I gave it to you and, and I said, don't throw it in water. The reason you don't want to throw it in water is because it reacts violently with water explosively. So you can cause an explosion in your laboratory. That means sodium is dangerous, right? And if you took chlorine, which is a gas at room temperature, chlorine is a halogen, it's not a metal, it's a non-metal. And you fill the room with chlorine gas, it's going to be toxic. It'll kill you if you inhale it. It's, it's, it's bad. It's dangerous too. So here you have sodium, which is dangerous, chlorine, which is dangerous. If you were to combine these two to make a compound called NaCl, then that, that we would, if we were to use the lower levels properties, sodium is dangerous, chlorine is dangerous, then we might predict that we're going to get twice the danger or we're going to get dangerous, even dangerous squared. It's going to be more dangerous, but that's not the case. What happens here is that the properties of this compound are actually quite different than what you would have predicted from the lower level. The lower level of the atoms, dangerous, dangerous. Then you get something that you put on your french fries from Whataburger. Not so dangerous, right? Uh, so we would not have predicted that. And that's true at every level of organization. When you go from uh, 
compounds to big molecules, you would never be able to predict the, that. So they require study. Every level of organization requires study. So those new properties that arise as you go from one level of organization, in this case, atoms, to a higher level, those properties that you couldn't predict by summing the properties of the lower level. You can't, you can't just add them up and say, this is what I'm going to predict. Something different comes out. That's called emergent properties. So emergent properties, there's new properties that emerge. Uh, one of the most amazing and fantastic uh, and wondrous uh, emergent properties that occurs is conscious thought uh, that occurs when a whole bunch of nervous tissue becomes highly organized in the human brain. Uh, that's an amazing emergent property that, uh, that we observe. In this section, we're going to describe the uh, process of science, which is a way of knowing uh, or learning about the natural universe. So uh, your learning outcomes for this section and called the nature of science uh, is uh, first one is to compare the different types of reasoning used by biologists, which are a type of scientist, and then demonstrate how to formulate and test a hypothesis, which is some of the basic science methods. So what is science? Um, Science is a, is a process of trying to understand the natural world or the natural universe uh, when we look outside the, uh, the world. So we do this through observation and reasoning. If we cannot observe it with our senses or extensions of our senses, uh, like a microscope, telescope, uh, or even a metric ruler, uh, if you can't make observations and repeatedly make observations, uh, it's not going to be science. And we also use a little bit of logic and reasoning when we do this. So all science always begins with observations, and that means you study uh, and you pay attention uh, to things that you observe uh, in the natural world. And so when we do observational science, it's really descriptive. Uh, there's no experimental. Some people try to argue that this is not real science, but when you do observational studies in a very systematic way, uh, you will uh, attempt to reduce bias in what you're observing and you record data very carefully, it is a very valuable science. It is uh, how we begin learning about uh, nature and the natural world. Uh, a good example of observational science would be to study life forms and then try to classify them into related groups um, and then test those uh, classifications and those relationships. Another one would be uh, just sequencing the human genome. Uh, which is the full set of genes uh, that we see in the human uh, human chromosomes. So science is going to use different kinds of reasoning. There's deductive reasoning, there's inductive reasoning. So when it comes to uh, starting out with observations, a lot of times you're making observations and uh, these observations will lead to hypotheses that you would uh, like to test. Uh, and if you test enough hypotheses over a bunch of related ideas, uh, then those can be used to develop theories. Uh, so um, basically, deductive reasoning is uh, is going to lead to um, uh, these ideas for testing theories and hypotheses. For inductive reasoning, uh, you're going to use a bunch of observations here, and you're going to develop general conclusions here. So. Um, these uh, observations might be, uh, a very simple example would be that you have been studying uh, a group of animals that has a backbone, they have wings and they have feathers, and you come to understand that a group of animals that you call birds, every time you find a new bird, it has feathers. So the next time you, you can now make a prediction, a hypothesis, based on all those individual observations that... When you come across a, net, a new identified species that has feathers, then it's probably going to be a bird as well. There's other things that define birds, but uh, the idea here would be that you would predict that if you come across an animal that has feathers, uh, then it, it's going to have other features that are consistent with birds. Okay, For example, birds, modern birds don't have teeth, right? So uh, you would you would expect to see that, uh, and so that was that's an example where you get specific observations to build a bigger idea. Uh, and both types of reasoning can be used or are used together. So you might use inductive reasoning, you build a hypothesis or a theory, and then you use deductive reasoning. So you're using that idea now. You're going to go uh, test it uh, with deductive reasoning.
science uh, is going to be hypothesis driven. Uh, and so it's a, science itself is a systematic approach on how we attempt to learn better truths about the natural universe. I'm going to say natural universe because it's uh, nature goes beyond uh, the biosphere uh, here. So um, it, it's very systematic in that uh, you you your approach it makes every attempt to try to eliminate bias because uh, we're all human. We have bias. We see the world through uh, our system of beliefs and experiences. So the idea here is use these methods to try to be objective in the way we study the natural world. And so part of that is a well-designed experiment or observational study. The other part of it is letting your peers try to, uh, to use those same ideas of reducing bias to uh, critique your work. And so the idea here is we use this method we collect information through observational study or experiment, and the idea is to develop ideas, hypotheses, and theories and test them. And as we go about this process, we eliminate ideas that are not supported by evidence in favor of better ones. We never prove anything, so we never ever say you prove a theory or a hypothesis, but that doesn't mean they are not useful. So again, we begin science with observations. And then these observations may be your own or it may be observations made by other scientists. So you're reading their published work in scientific journals. And so you're gaining all these ideas uh, from observation, even experimentation. And then you use those because those ideas usually lead to more questions. So now you have a question, scientific question, and you're going to formulate a hypothesis. Okay. Those hypotheses are going to allow you to make a prediction about something. So when you make that prediction, hopefully that prediction is something measurable, something that you can measure objectively with instruments, with your senses or extensions of them. Uh, and so you're going to test those predictions that the hypothesis makes. And you do that by experimentation, but it could also be through observation as well, more observation, like a more detailed observational study. And once you run that experiment, and you collect your data, you're going to see how does this information that you collect from your experiment relate to the hypothesis? Does that information support? Or does that information that you collect through experiment and observation reject? Never use prove. Okay. Now, there's proof that's your evidence, but you never prove these ideas. So science is, progresses by eliminating bad ideas in favor of better supported ideas. Okay? No science is ever proven, but that doesn't mean it's not useful to us. So here's a sort of a flow chart uh, that might take us through uh, this process. And it looks very, very complex, but in, in real life, once you start getting into these sciences, you're going to become familiar with lots of different hypotheses. Some have been disproven, some have been proven, uh, and they're uh, not proven but have proof to support them. See, so it's very easy to use the words inappropriately. Uh, and so uh, when we start here is you would start again with your observations mentioned before. That's going to lead to questions, well-developed questions. And those questions may have multiple answers. So here we have our potential hypotheses. So there's five hypotheses in this hypothetical, very generalized uh, situation where that question has some potential answers to them, um, uh, hypotheses. These hypotheses allow for predictions, right? So now you design an experiment to test these possible hypotheses to that question, okay? And in this particular general example, that experiment uh, in this case, happens to not provide evidence to support hypothesis one. So that one's eliminated. And hypothesis four. I don't know what the hypotheses are. They're generalized. Let's just say, for example, this experiment provides evidence that does not support those. So you've eliminated those. Those are rejected. So now you're left with the three remaining hypotheses, two, three, and five. And so now you design an experiment to further test uh, it might be a different experiment that's going to test these, but still trying to answer that same question. And in this experiment, the experiment now provides data that does not support hypothesis two okay, and hypothesis three. So that leaves hypothesis five. So we rejected uh, two and three, and we now go with hypothesis five, 
and hypothesis of five can make uh, is still able to make predictions. So we have the predictions from hypothesis five. And we run experiments. And you run, you're you running the same experiment or a modification of the experiment, and you're testing uh, that hypothesis and its predictions that it makes. And let's say experiment one supports and confirms. Not proven, but supports that uh, hypothesis from the experiment. Same thing for two and three. And then a fourth experiment, uh, however it was run, does not support uh, the hypothesis. So... Uh, that's useful. Okay, we ran this experiment. It doesn't support the predictions. What when? What's going on? So you think about it a little bit further. Say, so, well, the way you tested it revealed some new possible explanations. So you go back and you modify this hypothesis. And while these experiments did support it, this one, a different experiment, did not support it. So now you go back and you make your modification and see, does that modification still allow us to make the predictions for these types of experiments, one, two, and three, and you run them again, and now you run four again and see, based on that slight modification on that hypothesis, does running experiment number four now support it? And if it does, then that helps provide information. But the one thing that's going to be true here is that every time you go through this process, you're going to have new questions now as you learn more and more about the system that you're studying. Okay, so that's the beauty of science is you're always going to have a job as a scientist. There's always questions to answer, and that's what's really cool about science. Okay, so your typical experiment uh, has uh, some components that you should deal with. So when you're talking about a, an experiment, we're talking about a controlled uh, experiment. So I'm going to go ahead and write that there. And the controlled experiment allows you to test some factor uh, on a system, on a biological system. The system can be just chemical reactions that occur in the cells based on uh, enzymes, chemical reactions that normally occur. And your system is just the reactions. That's a system, okay? A living uh, uh, chemical reaction system. Your system could be a cell. It could be a whole organism. It might be a population of squirrels out in a forest somewhere. And that's the system that you are testing. Okay, so... Uh, you're going to test that hypothesis, and there are components that we should consider. So there are factors, okay? And so there's test factors. We'll call these variables. Uh, so the test factor is called the independent variable. I'm going to illustrate these for you on the next slide, but just to overview of what we're going to be looking at. Then there is the response. There's going to be something about that system you're testing that you want to measure to see if there's a response uh, in that system. So the response is what you're measuring after you run the experiment, like see, was there a change that took place? The test variable is, or factor is gonna be what you're, you're gonna test this item to see how it affects that system. Then there are other factors that have to remain constant, okay? You only wanna test one factor. You can't, let's say you wanna test the effects of, um, of salt on plants. Does salt help or hurt the growth of plants? Then that's the only factor that needs to be different, and you're going to need a control group of plants that are not exposed to the salt. You're going to need a group of plants that are exposed to the salt, but everything else needs to be the same. It needs to be the same kind of plant. It needs to be the same dirt soil. It needs to be the same amount of water. Everything is the same. That way you're only testing that one factor. Okay, That's what makes it controlled. So these constants are very, very important. Some other ideas that I'm going to explain on the next slide are the idea of replicates and the groups, uh, which are experimental groups and control groups. Okay, so let's illustrate these so that these terms make sense. And then you want to go back after you've seen this video. You want to make sure you write yourself some notes, maybe sketch a little basic design for yourself, much like I'm going to do here. Uh, you might do it with an animal. For example, maybe you want to test a fish food on fish. Uh, or whatever it is you're interested in, and you go ahead and uh, do a little sketch of how an experiment might look based on some factor you want to test. So here I have uh, plant A and plant B, and you can see in this picture here that plant A is going to be, uh, we're going to use fertilizer on it, and plant B we're not. Okay, So our test factor seems to be fertilizer, 
and that's going to be our test factor. And then for plant B, we're not going to have it, but everything else needs to be the same. It needs to be the same plant, same type of pot, same amount of soil, same amount of water, exposed to the same amount of light. So you see how they're put together near the light there. Okay, so let's list our items here. Okay, so uh, our, our test, and the, the name of te the test factor or variable is also called the independent variable. And for this, for the plant group, this is going to be the fertilizer. So the uh, fertilizer, we're going to expose plant A, and here we're not. Okay, no fertilizer. We're not going to expose that to the group. So since we're testing fertilizer, that's going to make this the experimental uh, plant. And this is going to be your experiment run without, uh, and sometimes they call it treatment. So I'm going to put a slash there and say treatment. Okay. And this is, a, we're running the experiment again, but since we're not exposing it to that test factor, we're going to call this one the control. So this is your control plant. Okay. Uh, and so what is, in this case, our independent variable is going to be fertilizer and then no fertilizer. We also are going to need a response a variable. And this is sometimes called, also called the dependent, because it depends. We're seeing if this variable depends on what we do with the independent variable. So this is a dependent variable. And in this case, how can we measure, you got to be thinking, as a scientist, you know this system. You've been studying plants for a while, say, well, how can we tell if fertilizer is helping? Well, one thing you might do is measure growth. You can measure growth several ways. You can cut the plant and then see how massive it is, measure mass of the plants. Or without killing the plant, you might measure the length of the shoots, the stems that come up above ground. And so let's just go with that one here. So we're going to do that for both. So we're going to measure the length, and the length might be in centimeters or whatever, and it's going to be the same. You're going to measure that for both. You do that after you've run the experiment. That's your response, okay? Then you're going to need... The constants, right? And here, constants, these are going to be all other factors. All other factors need to be constant, okay? So that's the same for this, for your plant A, and the same for plant B. And what are some of those factors? You can think about them and list them yourselves. Same amount of water in both plants, same type of soil, same plant species, and so on uh, overall. Now, we have one problem here. Okay, and that if I just grew these two plants with everything constant, forget the fertilizer, same soil, same amount of water, same amount of sunlight, any possible factor that can affect them, these two plants are not going to grow exactly the same. They're individuals, just like you are an individual and other, other uh, people that might sit with you in a classroom are different. We're all different heights. We have different physiologies about us. It's genetic. There's genetic variation, right? So in order to be able to account for that variation that we see in this population of plants and see how does this factor affect that variation, you're going to need to repeat each of these experiments. There's your treatment experiment and there's your control experiment. And that's where replicates come in. And so for replicates, replicate is a repeat of the experiment. Replicates. Okay. And so what does that mean? That means for plant A, you're going to have to make several of these plant A's. You're going to have to have several pots that you're going to treat with fertilizer. And you're going to measure the length when you're done. And all of the factors need to be the same with the other plant. Okay, So uh, let's say you might pick a nice round number of 10. 30 is like the perfect number, but sometimes 30 is, more, uh, is going to take you more time than you have time to do. Uh, resource-wise, but you don't want to just have two replicates or three, all right? Five, seven, the more the better, uh, but again, you're, you're always limited on resources. 30 is actually the best perfect number. It's not perfect, but it's like a good number rec recommended for the statistics you use for analyzing data. Uh, and so if you're going to do 10 here, then you're going to want to have 10 replicates also for the control. And so what does that make? That's not a, we're no longer talking about an experimental plant and a control plant. We're talking about a group. Okay. 
and we have a control group. So why are they called groups? Because you need to have replicates, okay? So this will be a well-designed experiment. And now, because you're you're growing 10 in under each condition, under the control condition, under the fertilizer conditions, what you're going to see now is you're going to see what effect you you the fertilizer might have on that variation you see in, in that uh, in those plants that are treated with it. And if the plants happen to be bigger on average than they are plant B. Uh, that's already going to show an effect. And then you have to, there's little tricks that you do to where you analyze that variation too. Something we're going to learn in the lab called standard deviation that we're going to use to further assess to see if the average heights of these plants or whatever uh, response you're looking at in your system uh, to see if there is a significant difference. And it could be that there's no effect, right? So that's why you do your experiments, okay? So that's your controlled experiment. Uh, again, when you're running an experiment, you're going to already have a hypothesis. It has made predictions. In the prior example, we would predict, for example, that fertilizer would cause an increase in growth rate of the plants, right? And then you test against the control group. Um, now, the predictions are going to provide a way to measure, uh, a way to measure whether or not that hypothesis is uh, a good hypothesis or not. It's valid. Right, they use the term validity here. How valid is it? Now, if we were to run that experiment and the plants with the fertilizer are no bigger than the plants without the fertilizer, then you must reject that hypothesis that said the fertilizer is going to help them grow faster, right? Uh, however, if you run it and the plants with the fertilizer grow bigger, you didn't prove the fertilizer, you just provided evidence to support it, right? And the more you can run that experiment, if you had time and resources, the more correct or supported or the valid that hypothesis. But remember here, they're not saying proven, they just say valid. Or another way to say that is supported, okay? That goes back to what I said before. Never say prove, never, okay? I'm repeating that again so you don't do that. Okay. They give another little science uh, example here. I encourage you to read it on, uh, it was testing something called spontaneous generation, uh, which was an actual idea uh, back in the day. Uh, and they're testing two opposing hypotheses, the germ hypothesis and spontaneous generation hypothesis uh, with broth. And it's the same idea here, just like we had two hypotheses in my example earlier. Fertilizers are going to help the plants grow bigger and better or not going to, right? So you have these two competing hypotheses. So there's two philosophical approaches to science. There's reductionism. And here you're going to take your system. Systems in biology are quite complex. And you're going to break it down into simpler parts. And then you study the individual parts uh, for what they are. Uh, and then there's a systems biology where you study the entire system and you're looking at those emergent properties we mentioned earlier. Remember, emergent properties are going to be things that uh, you would never predict uh, if you were to just look at the individual parts, right? So um, an example might be I'm going to study a forest community. So I'm going to study all of the plants uh, and animals that are in there. And as I describe and learn, do it through observational studies and maybe some experiments uh, that I might be able to design out in the field, I look at it, and what I'm doing is I'm studying this larger uh, system that you would never be able to predict by looking at the individual trees and animals in there. Uh, now, there, there's these two approaches. Let's say I wanted to model the forest and see if I can... Uh, actually design a model that actually fits with what I see when I'm studying that entire forest, I might apply what I've learned as a reductionist, where I went and I studied individual trees and then use those components and put them together. And based on those, try to des design a model that, that allows me to predict what I've been seeing in, in the broader system. So there's these two approaches for, uh, for studying it. I found personally that I've, I needed both. Uh, uh, when I study a bird community, I'm going to learn about that bird community, but a reductionist understanding where I go and I learn about the individual bird species out there has provided insight, better understanding of what I'm seeing in the broader system of the bird community where you're looking at several different bird species at the same time.
So uh, I use the word models. Uh, I've used it before. We use them all the time. And some models can be physical models. We've seen the model of the globe of the earth and so on. Uh, some models are verbal or descriptive models. They're in words, right? So you can have verbal models about things. Uh, we can have physical models. Okay. Uh, and you can also have the most formal model, which are mathematical. Mathematics is the language of science, and biology uses math as well. When you can provide a mathematical equation that uh, is a model for that system, then that allows us to make predictions about what's going to happen in that system, and that, that's the most useful kind of model. So these mathematical models, sometimes you'll see them referred to as formal models. Uh, and so if you've ever taken basic physics or chemistry or physical science, even in the 8th, I've taught 8th grade and 7th grade before, sometimes they give you these little equations, little equations to make you help you predict uh, mass or speed of things or, or how fast something is going. Those are formal models, right? So these models are going to help you organize thoughts and the parts for those models, as I mentioned before, are going to be provided by, provided by reductionist approach. So we want to learn about a forest ecosystem uh, and we're going to build a model for that forest ecosystem, then we're going to plug in what we know about the parts of that uh, ecosystem. So we plug in our, what we learned about trees and the animals and so on, right? And what those parts of the model do are going to help us see how the parts fit together. And then once we build that model, then we uh, see, okay, let's get those parts to interact with each other and see if what we get in the overall behavior of that system matches what we actually see out there. And if we do that, then we have a better understanding of how those parts are coming together to work. And so um, the idea of scientific theory um, and what is a scientific theory? A theory uh, is, uh, it's an explanation. Okay, so it's different than a law. A law just describes how things go for a scientific law. A scientific theory is well-supported, well-tested. It's a bunch of related concepts, and we say interconnected concepts. An example in chemistry would be atomic theory, right, um, uh, which describes how matter behaves. Uh, in biology, there's several theories, uh, for example, biological evolution, that help explain a bunch of related phenomena. Now, these uh, theories are have been have so have withstood testing so they are well supported by experimental and observational evidence uh, they have passed reasoning and logic and um, they are actually allowed the usefulness of them is that they allow us uh, to express ideas that we are most certain about and those ideas or theories provide great predictive power so this allows us to predict things uh, that can happen. Uh, and when models, uh, which are uh, scientific theory is a model, uh, when they're most useful to us, that's when science is used for our benefit as humans. Uh, and so there's lots and lots of theories. Not one of them is proven. You never prove them. But they are well supported by testing. Okay. Uh, so... We can't just dismiss a scientific theory as saying it's only a theory. Okay, that's uh, some arguments you see outside when it comes to politics and all of that stuff. It's not just a theory. They, the, they, 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 there's a move, a push to try to put to move uh, the idea that a scientific theory is like the way we use theory in real life, which is this last part here. In everyday, in the in the everyday world, we're out there. We say, well, I have a theory about what happened to my pencil. Right, you're just—it's a blind guess as to why you lost your pencil. It's not the same thing. A scientific theory is well supported, well tested, and it's provided predictive power. That's the difference, right? So, we don't have to—we don't have to believe science to accept that these things work for us and, and to use to our benefit. Anytime you go to the doctor, you're benefiting from all kinds of biological and chemistry and physics theories that none of them are proven, but allow great prediction that benefits you. Uh, and that's also true of biological evolution, which seems to be very controversial out there. I never tell students, hey, you have to believe this. Hey, you're, you're going to go to the doctor. We accept that those ideas have helped us provide better treatments, and that's good enough for me. Uh, it's a great idea. It helps us make predictions, and maybe, you know, it doesn't have to conflict with what, uh, with what uh, um, 
with what fo- folks' deepest beliefs are is, is my point here, and that's really where science gets attacked a lot. A lot of a lot outside of class in the political realm, so it doesn't have to be that way. We accept it. Science helps us uh, overall. It helps everybody, regardless of where you're coming from, what your background is, what your beliefs are. Uh, so I like to use the word accept science. So they're going going to science now. There's the basic research and there's applied research. The applied research is how we take our fundamental understanding of the way the natural universe works, right? That's basic research. So basic research is just trying to learn it for the sake of learning it, right? Learning and understanding better how systems work. So science never proves stuff, but we uncover a series of better truths, not the absolute truth, but better truths, right? That's basic, okay? Uh, And so then applied research would be when you take what we've learned from basic research and then you use that to better uh, uh, take advantage of it to better uh, better um, uh, our lives, for example. Uh, our ancestors did it a long time ago when we just looked at seeds and learned, hey, plants grow from those seeds, and then also learning which ones are edible. That's science. That was science back then. Uh, and we do that today, right? So we learn about... Um, how systems work, and then we design better medicines, better foods to eat, and and so on. And one of my favorite areas is conservation biology with endangered species and all that stuff. Well, ecology, learning how, is learning how the plants and animals and everything else in the ecosystem interact with each other. That's basic research. But if you're a wildlife biologist, you're an applied research person who goes and takes what the ecologist has learned, and then you use that and you apply it to help conserve um wildlife. Uh, so the wildlife would be an applied uh, science, whereas the ecology would be more basic science. So when we say basic research, it's the same as saying basic science. Okay, And applied research is the same as applied science. Okay? An example of applied science would be medicine, if you want to go into a medical doctor, for example. So uh, 